Everybody has their own convictions and when they speak freely, say that this is how they see it and this is how they will live by what they see. And But we must declare that there is one truth. Oh, there is one truth. There cannot be two truths or three truths. There has to be one. Here, one fellow who was not like we are. He came from a place that we desire to be. And he said some words that I want to say to you in St. John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the truth. And there is no going around it. Hello brother, hello sister. There is no going around it. Jesus Christ, he embodies truth. And he says that if you will enter into life, you must have me. We are realizing that the times to which we have come are serious times. We are coming to acknowledge that we have come to know some very difficult days. Something is happening in the world. Brother, sister, you are at Stephanie's shop. Somebody will confirm that we're streaming. We're streaming. The, the communications team is confirming that we're streaming. Somebody is at Stephanie's shop tonight. You, brother Calvin, I greet you, brother. I know you are there, you have been attending. We want you to know that you have found the right place. Somebody else is with you at Stephanie's shop. We want to welcome them as well and let you know that you are at the right place. Somebody is in Hopewell Square, you are perhaps headed home. You are perhaps trying to beat the curfew, but you have a little moment to just listen to what I have to say to you tonight. Because we have come to know some difficult times. You are in Kakoon Castle, and you are lending a listening ear in Top Hill as well. There is something that is happening in the world. And I will not get philosophical. I will not give social updates. I did those in my first and second messages. But I want, to, I want to speak about the principle of what is happening. And here it is. Man's heart has gotten so indifferent towards his God. Come on now, church. Man's heart has steeled itself against the promptings of God. And he goes in his own way. He sees that there is still a heyday and he sees that there is much time. He perceives that he has much moons to go and many years to go. He feels the strength of his spinal tenacity and he feels that he can press along, live as he please. Hear me brother, hear me sister. Tonight I must talk to you about a serious subject. Last night God allowed us to puff his hands and put his feet in stocks and he sat in the seat for questioning and for impeachment. But we concluded that he is not guilty. Tonight it is not God who is in custody, it is man who is in custody. And so tonight's subject is man in custody. I wonder if somebody understands that man is called, is summoned to the bar of judgment. I wonder if somebody understands that, that man is walking freely and not knowing that certain danger is just ahead. I wonder if somebody understands and appreciates 
Kate Bay, Jamaican adage that fire there must be still and he think is cool breeze. I wonder if somebody can understand that the times are urgent. I want to talk under the caption that man, that man is in custody. If you will turn your word, if you will turn the Bible, the scriptures, God's word, and if you will go to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, you will find that there are some very frightening findings. You will find that, that the all-searching eyes of God have found us out and have uh, declared our condition. And if you will look from uh, verse 18, then you will understand that from verse 18 down to about verse 21, you will understand that man is revealed and man is found wanting. That, that man has been laid bare open. Ah, that man is in a situation where he has been found out. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Let me sit a little bit. And let me read it again because you perhaps missed it. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. From where church? Against all ungodliness. I want you to know that scripture says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It is not from the courts of earth's legislative halls that this conclusion has come. It is from heaven. It is from the place where no error can dwell. Are you hearing me somebody? You must understand that the records of our life are written with strictest precision. You must understand that the records of our life are written in indelible ink and cannot be erased because God has recorded through his ministering angels every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And so the wrath of God is being stirred up as it reveals the condition of man that within our hearts we have hold, we have held rather the truth of God in unrighteousness. I wonder if somebody in the whole point of spirit is hearing me. Verse 19 says that because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. God has revealed to the heart those things, those matters that pertain to life. Uh, God has revealed to the conscience and God has worked out within nature and within our experience. God has revealed those things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, so scripture says in verse 20 that even the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I don't care what you teach in your schools. I don't care what field of study 
you have chosen, I don't care what the curriculum is that you have uh, allowed for in your establishment. I don't care what you have written in your books. One thing is clear that you can declare from any pulpit as you will, from any auditorium as you will, you can declare that God is dead as much as you will. You can declare that God is irrelevant as much as you will. You can declare that we are our own gods within our own rights as much as you can. But there is one thing that you and I must reckon with my brother. There is one thing that you and I must reckon with my sister. And that is that there is a mighty God who makes his condescension within the seas of our hearts. And he stands there looking at us so that if we turn our head to the right, we still see him. If we turn our heads to the left, we still see him. If we turn our heads backwards, we still see him. If we turn, if we look forward, we still see him. Because God is appearing everywhere. God is in the lowest hell and the highest heavens. Are you hearing me down there? God is under every green tree. God is in every green shrub. God is in, is in every dry bush. God is in every cavern. God is in every catacomb. God is in every valley. God is on every mountain top. God is in every palace. God is in Congress. God is in the legislative halls. God is in our schools. God is in our church. You might not give him the highest seats there. You might not introduce him. You might have not invited him. But let me tell you, my brother, your God and my God, you can claim him or not, but he is your God and he is within his own rights, appearing everywhere. So let me tell you, man, and let me tell you, sister, let me tell you that you can deny and you can defy as much as you please. But here comes a terrible and unnotable day that God has reserved when he shall judge the world, when he shall summon you and I to the bar of his throne. And unless we are right with him, unless we have walked with him, unless we have confessed him, then double trouble will be waiting. Then double trouble shall be a reward. Let me tell you, man, let me tell you, sister, humble yourselves before God. Man is in custody. For he chooses his own path. Can I preach tonight? Man is in custody. We questioned God last night. We said, God, if you are there, how is it that there are so much evils? How is it that there is so much sorrow? Uh, I, I see the, the 14 year old, his, 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 his life being snuffed away by leukemia. And, and all I could do was punish for him and said, my God be with you. How is it that there is a God in heaven? How is it I went and I visited our elder. And when I saw the situation, my heart churned within me. As somebody said, Pastor, how do you preach this God who will allow so much suffering? Ah, uh, somebody asked God the question last night. If you are real, how comes there is famine? How comes there is pestilences? How comes there is so much injustices? How comes uh, the, the man turns the gun on his mother, on his common-law partner, on his children, and then gets away? How comes there isn't 
judgment. How comes your God is good, yet he allows these things? Well, let me tell you something. As we concluded last night, it was not God who erred, but it was man who erred. Are you hearing me, somebody? It was we who turned like a stubborn sheep going after our own ways and have incurred uh, the results of sin and have experienced degeneracy and have experienced disaster and have experienced death. It was not God, but we concluded that even though Satan comes with all these atrocities so that he could depress us, so that he could repress us, so that he could shackle us, we concluded last night that God does allow some assaults from the enemy to come upon God's people because God knows what he is doing and he knows the will that he wishes to work out in our lives so that when we come under attack we come to understand that it was God's way of working so that our countenance can look like him so that we can come out of the furnace looking like gold tried in the fire so the next time you are quick to complain brother the next time you are quick to complain about your challenges and about your groanings and about your debt and about all sorts of ills that has been done to you just remember that when you suffer as a Christian then you suffer in the name of Jesus come on church when you suffer for righteousness sake then you are being prepared for a better country and when you suffer for the sake of righteousness when you suffer when you have done good please know that there is a wonderful treasure that has been prepared for you and it's not in this land it is the land above beyond the azure blue please know brother please know sister that our God is faithful and though he sees you going through some stuff he will take you to the better land one day so don't give up but man has come under pressure. When you look at the world, even the blind can see that something is about to happen. That there is about to be a colossal collapse. That the very foundation of this earth is rattling neath the tread of immorality, neath the tread of ungodliness. I have not known such an such a godless generation in the God. The little man says he wants to be a good man. Where do you think he got that from? Society has become a lesson book that teaches the principles of ungodliness. That the impressionable minds of our children are affected. Consider the media ministry, the entertainment industry, the kinds of lyrics that come through these airwaves and the, 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 the government allowing these things. You will go in the bus. I don't know what happens now with our current crop of high school students. But if you will allow me to confess, in my time, it was dance hall every evening from school. I wonder if somebody's understanding. Dance hall. Our, our children. I've seen many who demonstrated much potential. Who, because they went off in their own way, they went down south and nothing came of them. But there is hope for somebody to live. 
God did not err. God did say that if you go over there, you will open the floodgates of children. So he says, stay over here. But because another person came and said, man, you are free to inhabit as far as the eyes can see. He went over in the forbidden path. And now the heart has been weakened. And the moral capacity is weakened. We are not even able to do good by ourselves. I wonder if somebody understands that the good that you do is not even you who do it. Our hearts have become so entrenched in sin that it is easier to sin than to do good. I wonder if somebody can understand that man has strayed from the revelation of God's will and have gone on in his own rational thinking. Rational thinking passed away. Saying, there are two things that are wrestling for the scepter in our world. There is revelation on one hand. And there is reason. Revelation says, this is the way of the Lord. Walk in it. But reason says, I don't see this path to be a habitable path. I don't see this path to promise any yielding fruit. So instead of restricting me, in, instead of telling me where I can walk, when I can walk, let me see for myself where I can trust and let me go there. Reason says, I can figure it out all by myself. Can somebody understand that we have made of ourselves our own gods? For we have determined for ourselves, we have become so self-sufficient. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 18, and I want to talk for the next 10 or so minutes about man being in trouble with God. In Genesis chapter 18, hear me brother, hear me sister, there was there were two cities that were in serious trouble with God. Genesis chapter 18. Two cities. If you would ask me, though I'm not God, I would suggest that there are more than two cities today in trouble with God. But in this occasion, Genesis chapter 18 and I want to read from verse 17. The Lord visited Abraham one day. And he came with two other heavenly guests. They sat a while and they spoke. And after they spoke about things that pertain to the martyr life of Abraham and Sarah, God spoke about the promise of a child, even though they were well advanced in years. But the purpose, one of the main reasons that God had visited, was for what you will see now. The Bible says in verse 17 that the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Have mercy. God is about to do something, Sister Tashon. But, but he reasoned with his companions, with his angels. He says, shall I hide from Abraham that which I will do? Seeing that Abraham 
shall surely become a great and mighty nation. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Notice here that for the reason that God will determine that he should reveal his secret to Abraham was because Abraham would command his household after him. Can you understand that the will and the instructions and the, the word of God comes to his servants? Come on, somebody. Here the Bible says in Amos 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord does nothing but reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So on this premise, God will establish a communication lineage through which he would communicate with Abraham some critical issues that pertains the judgment of two cities. Is somebody here the judgment? God has established a channel for today through which he will communicate a message of warning to this world in which we live. Are you hearing somebody? God's church has been set up throughout the ages and in these times, in these last days to communicate what his intentions are. And let me tell you something, friends. Though his intentions are for the salvation of all of humanity, it will be bad for those who will end up on the wrong side of eternity. Somebody's here with you. Well, shall I hide from Abraham that which I shall do? Verse 20, the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now. I will go down now, God says. You must understand, friends, that judgment is not for some time in the indefinite future. Judgment is now. I wonder if the church is here tonight. I said, now is the day of salvation. And the same day for salvation has to be the same day for judgment. What do you mean, pastor? It is salvation for those who will accept God's invitation. But it is judgment for those who will reject God's invitation. It is not in some indefinite time. Let me tell you something. I hear Whitney Houston say, if tomorrow was judgment day, and I'm standing at the front line, and the Lord said, what did I do with my life? She said, I will say, Lord, that I spent it with you. But let me tell you something. That's not how the sound sings. Now is the day of judgment. Know that you have a heart. Know that you have a mind. Know that blood is running through your arteries. Running through your veins. Know that your faculties are in place. And you can determine right from wrong. Know that you can understand a simple call from heaven. Know that you can understand that to reject God is a detrimental matter. Now is the day. Now is the time. Not some time after you have wasted your life. Not some time. But now. So when we say, brother, when I say to you that if you hear God's voice, then harden at your heart. When I say to you that if you hear God calling, if you feel him telling you to run from the situation of sin, run from that person with whom you share a, a 
unholy institution than her own my brother because if trouble was to circumvent you tonight you would have no time in death to repent for scripture says there is no repentance in the grave so if you hear God's voice then harden not your hearts tonight no God says shall I hide it from him are you listening to me brother God is a transparent God. He does not operate in isolation. He shows you so you can see clearly if his ways are just or not. And so he invites man into intercession. So Abraham beckon for his mercy. Surely you are the judge of all earth. And you will not judge the righteous with the wicked. If you could find 50, therefore, 50 righteous, just 50, in Sodom and Gomorrah, won't you spare the city? God said, I surely will. Well, 45? God said, if I find 45, I surely will. 40? God says, if I find 40, I surely will. How about 30? How about 20? And it, the, the, the number kept on reducing. Sodom and Gomorrah had filled their cups, had filled the cup of God's judgment, had filled the cup of God's wrath. Let me tell you something, that even in the very night that the angels went down into Sodom, the men of Sodom decided that they would go off on a sinning spree. When the Lord shall send judgment for me or for you, my brother, it may be at night when the heart is fully set to do evil. Are you hearing me? It might be at night when you are on your way to the house that you must not go to. Uh, in the bed that you must not go in. Uh, it might very well be a night uh, that you will be on your way to a parish that you must not enter. Are you hearing me down there? When God's judgment will befall you, it will come, it may come uh, in a night when the heart is fully set to do evil. Are you hearing me down there? I want to find a text. Uh, I want to find a text. So that you can understand that mankind knows better. So you can understand that man knows better than he has done. I cannot find a text for the church. I cannot find a passage. I hear the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I think it's the book. I'm trying to find Ecclesiastes and verse 8 thereabout. There is something about the reprobate mind. There is something about the heart that determines that it must go against God. There is something about the mind when it is fully set. Well, I want to find something. I want to see if I can find something so you can understand that God, that God says in His Word in Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11, that because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So because a man does not drop to path uh, immediately when he sins, uh, he feels uh, that he has gotten away. He feels uh, that the seen eyes of God uh, have grown dim. But well, let me tell you something. Uh, from when I was a little boy uh, and I was in primary school, uh, I used to hear them sing uh, a little song in devotion. Uh, they say, watch your eyes. Uh, Watch your eyes, uh, what they see, watch your mouth, uh, watch your mouth, uh, what they say. Uh, for there's a father up above uh, looking down uh, in tender love. Uh, but let me tell you something, uh, we have caused God's heart uh, to become frowning uh, and grimacing. 
chosen and called because we have long rejected his mercy and because God does not strike us down dead immediately we are insisting on sin man has been found out see us going off in our own way but I want to find out why God felt like he needed to destroy Sodom. He needed to take five minutes to tell you why God needed to destroy Sodom. Let me tell you, friends, if you turn to Ezekiel, what book did I say, church? If you turn to Ezekiel, chapter 16, if you read from verse 49 and verse 50, then you will understand why God rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me tell you what the condition was. Ezekiel 16 verse 49. As a matter of fact, let me read from verse 48, as I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom, thy sister, hath not done, she not her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Verse 49, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. I don't know if the church is with me tonight. was the first one that God listed through Ezekiel the prophet. The heart is prideful. You, you, you cannot even correct me anymore. You, you cannot even tell me that I'm wrong anymore. But by the time you are through with telling me of my fault, I take occasion to tell you of yours. A pride and, and arrogance. Are you hearing me, somebody? Uh, we don't like to be told what to do. We are prideful. We we feel ourselves to to be uh, more than uh, we actually are. The, the the Lord said that your sin, the iniquity, actually of Sodom was pride, and, and not only pride but fullness of bread. I want to say to the church that because we have not known want, we have become indifferent to God sometimes. When we were in some hungry days, when we used to scour for food, when we used to struggle around, when we had to walk long distances in order to catch a little catchment of water and walk back home, then we used to be humble, but know that we have fullness of provisions, know that our tables are filled, know that our cupboards are filled, we feel ourselves are to be more than we are. I hear somebody, if you could look at the records and understand the amount of food that is wasted globally, then you would understand that we should not be having the rates of poverty that we are having in our world. But people have it so abundantly that they can throw it away as they like. Well, let me tell you something. Sodom had the fullness of bread. Let me tell you something about the fullness of bread. When there is fullness of bread, there is a correlation uh, with, with, with mistrusting. Uh, let me say it another way. There is a correlation with the fullness of bread and self-sufficiency. We feel that we can do it by ourselves. We feel that we can provide for ourselves. We feel that we can navigate every child and circumstance. We feel, as a matter of fact, that we cannot attract any challenge because our provisions and our possessions are sufficient. I hear the Bible says in Luke chapter 12 that there was one brother who had so much in his barns that, that he, he tore down his barns and built some bigger ones. 
to store up his goods. And he said to his soul, Soul, take thy knees. Be satisfied. Be merry. Have thy knees. But in the same night, God's judgment came upon him. God said, Thou fool, these things shall go to another. I want you to know that when we have heaped up possessions for ourselves and have hoarded and have kept uh, for ourselves and for those who don't even need it, you know what is happening in our world? There are those who want to share with those who they can benefit from. But the poor continues to scowl for the crumbs. So Solomon had fullness of bread. What else Solomon had? They had the abundance of idleness. Curfew could not even keep some of you off the streets. You, you, you had to find the streets. Even when you could have taken some time to, to recollect and, and look at your life and look at where you're going uh, and just snap out of it, snap out of hanging out at the shops every day, snap out of hanging out at the bar every day. If you could just take some time, but the abundance of idleness has become the reality of many today, as it was for some. You know what else? Happened to Sodom? Sodom, they did not strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy. We live in a world that is crazy greedy. It's all about what I can get and how I can fatten myself. And at all costs, even if I have to leave God's work unattended, as long as I can set myself in love, then I'm good. And we have some people in our little corners who need a little blessing from us. And sometimes they feel terrified to come to us and ask. But man is found wanting. So God came down and, and God said, let me see how Solomon has feared. Let me see how hope fears tonight. Let me see what is happening in Kakum tonight. Let me see what is happening in Great River and in Stephanie Shaw. Let me see what is happening in Hope Square. What will be the verdict? I give you one tonight that we are found wanting before God and unless we rise up from slumber, unless we rise up from idleness, unless we rise up from ungodliness, unless we rise up from the defiance of God, unless we rise up and run to God, then we will be running to the mountains one day. And too late shall be their cry. I must close. I decided to go unscripted tonight. Because I wanted to speak from my heart. Man is in trouble, not God. Don't be fooled, brother. You and I are in a place of serious reckoning. And unless we have God as our defense, then we will have Him as our execution. Unless, I'll say it again, unless we have God as our defense, and our pavilion, then he shall be our house of pain and our execution. Tonight, 
If you fear God, if you hear God, you know that you are in a situation that you should not be in. Meddling in the man's marriage. Living with a person who is not your spouse. Not afraid to preach God's word. Living a lifestyle that will lead you straight to hell. I said to a sister one night, as I gave her and her children a lift, heading for a place, saw that they needed a lift. I said to the sister, are you preparing for the coming of the master? And she gave a little giggle. And that was it. There is coming. The praise team is coming. Jesus is the answer for the world today. We offer him you. The only escape, and I will tell you tomorrow night, is in Jesus. You and I cannot have a better covering but in Jesus. Can I say it again, church? You and I can never have a better covering but in Jesus. I don't know if the praise team knows the song. Modern times have brought us many comfort. People live in wealth and luxury. But the master still asks the question, Lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? More than these. Bear with us. The live audience will stand with me. We're going to sing uh, a stanza, the chorus of this song. Modern times have brought us many comfort. And then the praise team will sing for the departure song and I'll pray. But I want you to know that it is because we have come to become so, so, so comfortable that we have rejected God. Let me tell you, brother, sister, we might not feel the fires yet, but it is at our tails and it will show you where. So come now to Jesus. If you are in the live audience tonight, and you want to indicate that you desire to follow Jesus, you can go ahead, you can raise your hand. Feel free, don't be afraid. Raise your hand, I see your hand, my sister. We have the bad work in the audience. She will come to you and give you a car. You are at Stephanie's shop tonight. You are in Hopewell Square tonight. There are some cards that you can take and fill it out and you can indicate your contact information. We will reach out to you and show you how you can escape that terrible judgment to come. But we're singing. Modern times have brought us many comfort. People live in wealth and luxury. But the master still asks the question. Love is not me. Love is not me.
You can feel, as it were, the very flames of your fury at our heels, for we are found wanting tonight. Who among us can declare himself worthy? Who among us can declare himself just and righteous? Only you are just and righteous, God. And all of us, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So God of our salvation, for the sake of somebody who took the time to stay with us tonight, will you send an emissary from heaven that will conduct that person to the place of the well spring of life where they can drink and never be the same again. Oh God, I pray for somebody who is shackled by the burden of sin. Somebody who is addicted to substance abuse, addicted to the sexual sin, addicted to murder and lies and stealing, addicted to infidelity and abuse. God, I pray that you will set somebody free tonight. For now is the day of salvation. But for some, it will be the day of judgment. And God forbid that we should perish tonight and our souls are not right with you. Then the opportune time for making a decision for you would have passed. So tonight I pray that somebody will choose Jesus. For Jesus is the answer for the world today. Thank you, Jesus, making yourself available. Many won't come, unfortunately. But we pray and we praise you for those who will come tonight. And may this Sabbath the waters be shown as they make their decision public to show that they love you and will return to you. This is our prayer. Take us home and back tomorrow night where we will look at the matter of Jesus is the answer for the world today. In his name we pray these things with everybody's name. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the answer. Let us sing it one time. Jesus is